Hey, I've got a video I want to play. Except a video. if I play it, yeah. then it only comes up. Oh, so then you <coughs> just drag it across. Oh, maybe I have to minimize this. I think you have PowerPoint. to minimize this. Yeah. So, to the minimize. Video. I want to play it. Except if I play it. Okay, I'm just going to write a note saying it's like any show. Um, yeah. Let me see. I still glitch off the walls. Mm -hmm. That's okay. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, did you do research that 
Yeah, let's start. Okay. Do you need your laptop? Um, yeah, I'll just say that. Say it, go for it. Okay. Hi guys, my name is Alan. Um, thanks for coming here tonight. I know four of you can be pretty stressful. So tonight I'll be talking about psychiatry um, in terms of anxiety, personality disorders, and also psychotherapies. I've put my email there. Um, absolutely feel free to email me if you have any questions at all. Um, this lecture hopefully will take under an hour um, and we can get out of here. So tonight we'll go through some general approaches to psychiatry. They help you, especially in OSCEs when you're a bit stuck. Um, we'll go through the other things I mentioned. We've got some practice questions. All of them are from the Moodle quizzes and also the Psychiatry College website. With the Moodle quizzes, they're only from Rotation 1's questions, so you've got all the other rotations to do. I'll go through some tips as well. Okay, so I thought since you guys have still got a little bit of time before your exams, um, it's not too late for some tips. So my first tip would be to look after yourself. Fourth year, it can be really easy to get caught up in all of it, but you need to look at fourth year is part of a bigger picture. It's just one year in your whole medical career. Um, how you do in the exams isn't going to drastically change what happens to you next year or the year after that. So just try to keep things in perspective, especially when you get stressed. Um, second tip would be to stick to your own proven learning style. So I'm going to give you some tips on how to study, but if you know that they don't work for you, then don't follow them. So if you know that you study the best just sitting in a library and reading a book, then go for that. If that's worked for you in the past, do that. When I was in fourth year, I suddenly decided I wanted to make really nice notes and I spent way too much time doing that and not enough time actually studying how it works for me. But um, I would say try to stay on track in the last two rotations. And so, for example, if you're doing PEDS now, Try to get all your PEDs learnt now because you're not going to have much time to catch up, especially as you need to fit in all of the year one, two, and three um, revision as well. Other tip would be to form a study group if you haven't already. Of course, this only works if you learn well in groups. It's good because you can motivate each other and it's good for OSCE practice. And at this stage, you should be practicing OSCEs at least once a week. Um, other tip would be to practice as many questions as you can. So I felt like that was the style which worked the best for me. And what I did was I signed up to Pass Medicine, a um, bit of free advertising for them. They're the cheapest service and they've got some really great questions. So you can do it on your phone. Um, if it gets boring on the wards, you can just bring it up on your phone and do some practice questions there. And psych specific, if you've still got psych this rotation or next rotation, it can be really tempting to just skip psych because they're pretty chill. It's pretty easy to get out of things. But I find that psych, especially when you're on acute adult wards, it's one of the most relevant ward experiences that you can have. What you see on the wards is actually what's on the exams and in the OSCEs. Um, you might find there are some 
other placements in site which are less important and you can figure that out for yourself. And definitely do the Moodle practice questions. A lot of what you see on the exam will be based off of that and do them for each rotation. So there are four. Don't just do your own one, do every single quiz available to you. They give you a bit of an insight into the mind of the guy who writes the exams. So let's get started. Um, the diagnostic hierarchy, you might have already covered it. It's basically the order in which you need to consider diagnoses when you're approaching things from a psychiatric point of view. So say you see a woman, a 49-year-old woman, who presents the ED with a six-month history of low mood, or not ED, probably GP in this case. It does sound kind of like depression, but because of this hierarchy, you've got to consider things above it. So firstly, you have to consider organic disorders, for example, hypothyroidism. So what this hierarchy does is it says organic disorders can cause any of the symptoms below it, but a personality disorder, for example, on the lowest rung, could not cause every psychotic symptom, for example. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. So remember this hierarchy. The same, dementia causing a 75-year-old man to become more irritable and impulsive. So it is a personality change and it could be linked to a personality disorder. But if there's a background of dementia, then that's the main diagnosis that you should be considering and treating and managing. And then and there's the biopsychosocial framework. You would have come across this um, overall in medicine, but in psych, it's great for management. What you do is in an OSCE in your case study, you, in the management section, you say, I would approach this from a biopsychosocial um, attack approach, and you'll sound really good. So biological, are there any biological things considering um, contributing to their condition? For example, if a lady tries to commit suicide and she is depressed, biological factors could include um, hypothyroidism or menopause. Social factors, she could have just lost her job. Um, she could have family conflict. Psychological factors, so those would be the depression, um, and such, low mood. Okay, so first we'll talk about anxiety. So firstly, anxiety is normal, um, and it's really important to recognise that, especially in a year like you see it. However, anxiety is abnormal when it becomes really extreme, when it's present in situations where you might not expect someone to feel anxious. So if someone in the audience of this lecture right now was feeling anxious, that wouldn't be particularly normal because I'm the one giving the lecture. You guys are just listening. And it's also abnormal when it causes um, an impairment in social function or causes the person a lot of distress. So you can group anxiety into primary. So that's the kind which really has no apparent reason for its cause, or secondary. So that can be due to organic illnesses. And up here, we've got the organic mimics of anxiety disorders, and those are things that you should always consider. Um, and it can also be due to psychiatric illness, and that includes things like a generalized anxiety disorder. <coughs> So generalised anxiety disorder. Um, psych is a lot of definitions and criteria. I find that the best way to remember all of these is to paint a picture of someone with this condition. And if you remember that picture and remember that story, then it can be easier to remember what you use to diagnose this condition. So with generalised anxiety disorder, it's persistent. So that means it happens more days than not and it's lasted longer than six months. That's a really key point. It's essentially when you have a um, very uncontrollable worry about a lot of things and it invades a lot of areas of your life. And you also need three or more 
of the symptoms that I've listed over here. There's an acronym, I think it's BSKIM, that you can apply to these. You can come up with whatever works for you. And in terms of management, first line is always psychological therapy. So in the case of generalized anxiety disorder, the most effective one would be CBT, which we'll go into later on in this talk. But of course, you also consider all of that psychological first aid stuff like psychoeducation, um, teaching them about their condition, teaching them how to manage it, and supportive therapy, so listening to them, being empathetic. That's all psychological first aid. Um, second line is pharmacological, so that means you don't jump to it straight away. But if you are going to try medications, with an SSRI like escitalopram or paroxetine, and then later on you move to these other medications. In terms of benzos, they are really great anxiolytics. However, um, as I'm sure you all know, we don't use them first line and we don't use them for long periods of time because they come with dependence, side effects, tolerance, addiction, all of that. So if your anxiety is really crippling and it's causing a crisis, maybe you could consider using benzos just as a rescue method, but you shouldn't really be using it for longer than two weeks and you might also need to consider weaning it if you do. Some people when they start SSRIs will almost bridge it with benzos because SSRIs can cause an increase in anxiety and agitation within the first few um, days or weeks of starting it. So that's generalized anxiety disorder. Now, moving on to panic kind of stuff. So panic attacks, by themselves, they are not abnormal, they're not a disorder. They're really common. In fact, I think it's about 15% of people will have one in their lifetime. You need to satisf uh, satisfy the criteria for more of all of these symptoms. And um, this is really where it helps to form a picture of someone having a panic attack in your mind so you can just rattle it off in an OSCE if you need. In terms of managing, um, you educate the person and that's really how you manage panic attacks. Not panic disorder, just panic attacks. So really just education. You teach them breathing exercises. So the main one is slow and deep breathing. You can also teach them to breathe into a bag. The reason why breathing into a bag isn't always practical is because if you're in public, you don't want to just whip out a bag and breathe in front of people. That might make you more panicked and anxious. So slow and deep breathing is a more socially um, acceptable option, I suppose. And of course, you should teach them stress management techniques that could include meditation, mindfulness, and you give them support. Okay. So panic disorder is made up of two parts. It's where you have really recurrent attacks and they're unpredictable. They could happen when you're in the middle of the street. It's not necessarily linked to a stressor. The second part is after all of these panic attacks, you experience feelings of anxiety and you try to avoid situations where if you have a panic attack, you couldn't get out of it really easily. And that has to last for one month, that feeling. And in terms of management, again, as you can see, it's kind of a recurring theme. First line, try not to go to drugs, use cognitive behavioral therapy. And then second line, if you do do drugs, um, use SSRIs, you might consider bridging as well. And then you've got your other options as well. So that's kind of um, a general approach to all anxiety disorders. And next we move on to obsessive compulsive disorder. So it's made up of 
obsessive obsessions and compulsions, which lead to distress and impairment. So here I said obsessions are recurrent unwanted thoughts. Can anyone give an example of maybe what someone they've seen on the wards has in terms of unwanted thoughts of what they've read about? Like yeah, that's right. So um, that's perfectly right. Like you said, the obsession, I have germs on my hand and I need to get rid of them, otherwise I'll get sick and die. And then the compulsion is to wash your hands and that can cause a lot of problems because it can cause a lot of social dysfunction. Um, other obsessions sometimes include recurrent thoughts, my family will die unless I make sure all the light switches in the house are off. And then the compulsion is to keep checking those light switches and they can't leave the house because they're afraid that if they do and they've forgotten the light switch, then their family will die. So that's another example. Would a person like that have a Um, It's got elements of it but you need some more criteria for delusional disorders, I think. Um, and then, as you can see, some of these obsessions and compulsions can cause significant stress and impairment. It can be really hard to hold a job if you have this disease. It can be really hard to interact with people on a normal basis. And then I said here that obsessive compulsive disorder is ego dystonic as opposed to ego syntonic. So by that, ego dystonic means that you yourself, you know you've got these obsessions and compulsions and you're not happy with them, but they rule you in a way and you try really hard to fight them, but you can't. So that's ego dystonic. That's opposed to ego syntonic where you could be aware of it, um, maybe not necessarily, but you're okay with that. So that would be the case with obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So someone with that personality disorder is really neat. They want things their own way. They try to strive for perfection, but they don't see anything wrong with that. And they don't see that it's causing them all of this trouble. So ego dystonic, you know you've got it and you don't like it. Ego syntonic, you're okay with it. Um, so in terms of management, you have to manage it not only with psychological approaches, but also pharmacological as well. So there's no first and second line here. Sometimes it can be so debilitating that you're not able to initiate any psychological treatment. For example, if you're afraid to leave your house, then you're not going to be able to get to a therapist, for example. So you need to start them on an SSRI to kind of calm them down a bit, make them a bit more stable and um, willing to undergo treatment. Then you use cognitive behavioral therapy, and that's in the form of graded exposure therapy. So that's the behavioral bit. It's also called systematic desensitization. So what you do is, it's two parts. You get them to confront their thoughts, but you also teach them how to get past them. So that could be relaxation techniques, meditation, ways of thinking. So you get them to confront their thoughts, and then you get them to try to ignore them, to stop doing that compulsion, and you build up. So it's like training at the gym, making a muscle stronger. With graded exposure therapy, you gradually increase their control over these obsessions. So that's obsessive compulsive disorder. Next, we'll move on to reactions to severe stress. So when we're under stress, everyone has coping mechanisms. Some are um, good and some are bad. There's further ways of dividing coping mechanisms, but we won't go into that. Um, the disorders we're talking about are when maladaptive approaches have emerged and they lead to an impairment in how you operate in the world. So in adjustment disorder with anxious mood, it's not necessarily a severe stress how your eye might see it, but to the patient, it certainly could be. 
So it's essentially when someone overreacts to a stressor. The classic example is someone's partner has broken up with them and then they go and drive a car into a lake and then they're also really anxious afterwards. So that's adjustment disorder. It's time limited, so it's a really acute thing. It can't be more than six months and it should resolve when a stressor or the consequence of that is gone. Um, to manage it, it's um, important to provide supportive psychotherapy, but in terms of actual concrete techniques, cognitive behavioral therapy as well, teaching them to acknowledge these anxious and stressful thoughts and to um, channel them or move on from them. And you also need to teach them problem solving skills as well. So if someone's um, stressor is arguments with family, then a problem solving skill might be whenever you feel like another argument's about to happen, or if it is happening, you remove yourself from the situation so that you're not exposed to that stressor anymore. If it's really, really severe though, they're really anxious, they might cause themselves some more harm, then you could consider diazepam again, almost like a rescue dose, like I said before, diazepam for about two weeks. Now, adjustment disorder differs from the ones that we've got up here. So acute stress disorder is something that lasts for less than a month. It's in response to actual exceptional stress, anything that the reasonable person would find stressful that can be physical or emotional. So that could be a natural disaster, for example, or being in a war zone. And then they've got these symptoms. So this is where it also really helps to paint a picture. What I imagine it is um, my little story that I've created is um, someone who's gone to Afghanistan to fight in the military. They've just encountered a lot of stressful and horrific things. And then they almost dissociate from their surroundings. Um, they become really agitated. They withdraw from um, their fellow soldiers. And they might not even remember their experience when you ask them about it later. So that's my little story. Um, the onset, it comes on within minutes and it should go away after a few days or well, hours. Oh, sorry, a few hours or days. Because it's time limited, it usually should self-resolve. However, you still want to intervene because if you don't offer support early on, then the chances of that acute stress developing into something more, post-traumatic stress disorder, are higher. So you offer them counselling, you tell them that their stress um, is justified, and then you give them trauma-based CBT, so that's with specially trained psychiatrists. So with acute stress, if it hasn't resolved after a month, and that's what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and then that's made up of three parts. You've got the re-experiencing symptoms part of it, hyperarousal symptoms and avoidance and numbing. So does anyone know what I mean by re-experiencing symptoms? Flashbacks. Yeah, absolutely. Flashbacks is one of them. Nightmares. Yep, it includes nightmares um, and really intrusive images in the mind. Those are about it. So that's re experiencing the event. How about hyperarousal? So, hyperarousal is essentially what it says it's where you're always constantly in a state of um, being switched on. So, you might be really jittery. You might have difficulty concentrating. Um, you might have difficulty sleeping, especially if you've got these flashbacks and intrusive images in your mind, and you might become really irritable. And then there's the avoidance and numbing symptoms. So does anyone know any examples of that? So an example of avoidance would be, say you develop post-traumatic stress disorder after being in a really um, horrific car accident. 
you might not be able to drive for a few months after that because every time you get into that car or even the thought of getting into that car leads you to um, become disabled in a sense. So that's an avoidance symptom. And then numbness is where um, you become really detached. You don't really show much emotion. And so that's something that you might see on a mental state exam. That's definitely a um, scenario which could come up. Numbness. So in terms of managing it, there's all these trauma-based psychotherapies, including CBT, which can help. There's graded exposure. So take again the car accident example. What you could do with someone is first get them to describe um, their fears of driving a car. Then you could get them to talk through how they might approach driving a car. For example, I would walk out of my house, go into the garage, unlock the car, and then you might um, do that same scenario but with pictures, and then you might work up to going to the car, getting into the car, and then eventually driving the car. I think you get a picture. There is also um, psychotherapy, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. I believe, I don't quite fully understand it, but I believe what you do is you get the person to recall these really um, distressing images and events and you stimulate their brain somehow while they're doing it and that helps. So I think it has come up as an option in some multiple choice questions. It might not have been the answer, but at least now you know eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing is PTSD, then I will give you a clue whether that's the correct answer or not. I think that the evidence is there for it, but it's not quite as good as um, CBT or graded exposure. Um, if you're really stuck, you can try SSRIs. They are the first line pharmacological um, means, but there's not really great evidence for them. And then how well someone does with PTSD really depends on how they were before, their personality, their health before, and it also depends on how severe the trauma was. So was it a car accident or was it um, a car accident with a lot of cars? I don't know. And how long the trauma went on for? Um, it also depends on their personal risk. So are they at risk of psychiatric illness? Um, do they have drug use? And it also depends on their family history of psychiatric illness, including post-traumatic stress disorder. So um, just another thing with studying for this, what I find really helpful is to get a piece of paper and then draw a timeline. And that helps you classify a lot of these. So you draw a timeline and you figure out that acute, acute stress disorder can only last for a month and anything more than that is post-traumatic. And you can also add all the other psychiatric illnesses on there, depression, um, I think it's greater than six months. So you draw a timeline and that way it's much easier to diagnose because a lot of the exam questions hinge on how long something's been going on for. It's really nitpicky, but I suppose it is important in coming to the right di diagnosis. Okay. So then there's phobias. So they also come under the umbrella of anxiety disorders. And that's where you have a fear out of proportion with what the actual stimulus is. So if you're afraid of a clown, generally clowns are quite harmless. So if you're really afraid of it, that's probably a phobia. But if you're afraid of, I don't know, if you live in the Middle East and you're afraid of ISIS, then maybe that's a bit more justified. Um, they can't be reasoned with, so you can't tell the person it's just a clown, they're real people underneath. Um, they won't accept that. And it leads to avoidance of those situations. So maybe if you had a phobia, then you wouldn't go near Luna Park, um, example. I don't know. 
Um, so there's a few different types of phobias. There's agoraphobia, <laughs> and that's a situational one. So that's where you're afraid of being in a place or a situation where you can't easily escape or get help. And that's often associated with panic attacks. So someone who has recurrent and unpredictable panic attacks or panic disorder, maybe, they might be afraid of going out because they'll have a panic attack and embarrass themselves and they won't be able to get help. But that's not the only thing. It could be other symptoms. Um, maybe an incontinence of some sort could lead to agoraphobia, any symptom really. And you treat that essentially with CBT exposure therapy specifically. Um, maybe working their way up to the front door, talking through the process of getting out there in the world. And then there's social phobia, which is the social version of agoraphobia. So instead of places that you're afraid of, it's social situations. So you're afraid of how you'll talk to people. Um, if I go to this party and I talk to this person, I'm going to make a fool of myself. That might be a social phobia. And the treatment's essentially the same. You can also teach them some social skills, especially if they've got an underlying psychiatric condition or maybe intellectual disability, which has impaired their social skills. So teach them basic things if they need, like when you go to a party, you introduce yourself, but not to everyone. Um, then you can also try SSRIs and SNRIs, because after all, it is an anxiety disorder. Then there's specific phobias. So there's the animal type, which is pretty straightforward. Some people are scared of snakes. A lot of people are scared of spiders. Um, does anyone know what I mean by natural environment type? So those are things like being afraid of heights, maybe being afraid of um, water. Yeah. And then there's the blood or injury type. So that includes being not only afraid of blood, but it could be being afraid of needles. So that's probably one that you'll encounter. And there's also being afraid of hurting yourself, having an accident. And then there's also a situational type, um, which might be like claustrophobia. You're afraid of being in situations where you might be really confined and squished. So that's situational type. And you manage that with graded exposure therapy, um, maybe with spiders uh, if you really wanted to treat it. Maybe you start off with looking at a picture of a spider. Some people can't even do that. And then you go on to a, a toy spider, maybe like a fairy cartoon one to start with, and a more realistic plastic one, and then eventually working up to a real life spider. <clears throat> That's Brobies. Okay. Um, oh, okay. I don't know how I'm going to do this because I've hidden the answer in the back. But okay, we'll try it anyway. So the first question, a woman undergoes a hysterectomy. After the operation, she's catheterized by an insensitive nurse and has a panic attack during the procedure. From then on, she isn't able to urinate. She isn't able to insert her own catheter, which she needs because it causes um, anxiety. So if whoever thinks of an answer, just yell it out. A uh, specific phobia. Um, no. Generalized medicine? Oh gosh, I forgot the answer. <laughs> Let me check. Okay, this will work. Yeah, sorry. So it is specific phobia. Um, the reason here being that it is specifically the act of putting in a catheter. Um, the reason why it's not a generalized anxiety disorder comes down to those really nitpicky criteria. So it has to be greater than however many months it has to occur on more days than not. And generalized anxiety disorder means that it's really about everything that you're worried about, not just um, urination and catheterization. Okay. 
So next question. Can you guys see that? Okay. A 32-year-old female is referred to you by a dermatologist. The patient presents with dermatitis of both hands, which the dermatologist believes to be psychogenic. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, OCD, absolutely. So, like we were saying before, an obsession could be my hands are full of germs and I have to do something about that. So, what would be the compulsion in this case? Yeah, that's right, washing your hands. Um, especially if they're doing it like 20, 30, 40, 50 times a day and they're not using moisturizer, then their hands are going to get really chapped and dry. Um, just with this one, can anyone think why it's not a conversion disorder? Because sometimes people um, answer conversion disorder. Can anyone volunteer a definition for a conversion disorder? Yeah, it is really specific, but it's also because of the type of symptom that we have here. So a conversion disorder is specifically, yeah, neurological symptoms like um, unable to move an arm or weakness. Um, so that all falls onto the broad category of somatization disorders. And so somatization, and under that you've got conversion. You can also have pain, so where they feel pain, but there's actually no cause. So that's why you can't, it doesn't fit. Okay, well, now you can just see the answer. Okay, so Mavis is 50 years old, and for at least 10 years, she's been reluctant to get out, and she gets really anxious and can't breathe. It's not every time. Sometimes she can go to the shops maybe, but it's enough that she's afraid to go out because it, it might happen again. So what do we think it is? <coughs> yes, yeah, see, and what makes you think that it's safe? Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. And agoraphobia, so she's had um, so many of these that now she's avoiding and anticipating. Um, yeah. Okay. So Jessica has always lacked confidence all through high school. She worries about her exams worries what her uh, friends think of her, what she wears, who's doing her fair share of chores at home, goes on and on. She's lost count of the number of times she's been to the local doctor with what the doctor has said are just minor things like dizziness, nausea, muscle cramps. And last month she had some numbness in her fingers. So what do we think this is? Yeah, that's right. And what leads you to think that? Yeah, so she, uh, like you said, she's had it for a really long time, all through high school. She's got those physical symptoms. Um, I think you needed three or four or more of them. And she's also got a pervasive worry about... Um, it's about everything. It's about stuff at home. It's about what she wears. It's about her performance at school. So that's a generalized anxiety disorder. And it's clearly causing her impairment in this case because she's gone to the doctor so many times um, with all these symptoms. That's a kind of impairment.
Okay, so Michelle is in year nine and was brought to the ED after taking an overdose of about 15 paracetamol. She said that she was devastated after her boyfriend of three months went to the movies last week with someone else. Now she's embarrassed and she feels like she can never go back to school again. <laughs> yeah, so it's adjustment disorder. Um, it does sound borderline-y, but it's adjustment disorder because we've got that overreaction and it's really acute. Borderline personality disorder, in fact, all personality disorders, they have to be really pervasive and stable over time. So you've got to exhibit this over quite a period of time. Yeah, of course you can. But then when you consider the hierarchy, so say for example, someone does have um, borderline personality disorder, but then they also have an anxiety disorder. Um, you focus on the anxiety disorder primarily before you focus on the personality disorder because that's higher up in the hierarchy. Yeah, this one's also one that a lot of people get wrong, so now you know the answer. Okay, so on to personality disorders. So you probably don't have one, probably. Um, I had a lecture last year about personality disorders, and by the end, I think I'd identified with every one of those personality traits and disorders that they were talking about. But that's actually normal because they're all normal traits in themselves. It's the pattern over time and the impairment and distress that it can cause to others that makes it abnormal. So essentially, our personality is made of um, our automatic ways of thinking and behaving and our emotions, how we therefore relate to other people and how we interpret and respond to our environment. And so all of us have personality traits and they're what make us ourselves and what differentiate ourselves from the others. And so just because you might have narcissistic traits occasionally or histrionic traits occasionally, you're a bit extra, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a personality disorder. And so there's a definition from the DSM. So essentially it's enduring. Um, it's different from the expectations of one's culture. It's inflexible and it kind of invades all areas of your life. And it can't, it, it's really hard to change. And it usually occurs around adolescence, so where we are now. Um, it's stable over time and it leads to, like I said before, distress or impairment. So whenever you see a STEM, and you're considering a personality disorder, look for something which says, this guy has always been really mistrustful of people, or this person has always been a bit attention seeking. <coughs> so we've got three clusters um, of personality disorders. When I was showing my boyfriend this, he was really annoyed by the fact that I hadn't lined up the specific images with the cluster that they belong to. So that's a trait because that's not pervasive and enduring in his life, he probably doesn't have obsessive compulsive disorder. So cluster A are the really odd and eccentric people. Um, they can be the really paranoid ones. And so I've got the definitions here. There are criteria in the DSM, but because it's not really, it's examinable, but it's not going to form a huge part of your exam and no one's going to ask you to diagnose it based on specific criteria. Building a picture is probably the easiest way of learning it rather than learning every single um, criteria. So there's paranoid people. They are always suspicious. They always see something behind someone else's motivations. Um, there's the schizoid. So these are the kind of weird people. They're the learners. Um, they don't want social interaction and that all contrasts with another personality disorder um, called avoidant personality disorder. So they don't want social interaction, they don't really care, and they don't really show much emotion. And they're predisposed to schizophrenia. So if you see someone with schizophrenia, especially in their, um, their low, low point, they appear very flat and dull and socially isolated. Then there's schizotypal, which is essentially someone with schizoid personality disorder, but then they have magical thinking. And 
so that can be things like um, always thinking that things, um, maybe inferring meanings behind things like, oh, uh, I can't think of an example right now, but inferring meanings behind things or having strange rituals, having strange beliefs. Um, maybe they're really, really, really into um, like star signs and stuff and they let that guide their life. And it often also presents with social anxiety. That's not, that's more they're anxious about themselves and um, they like self esteem. When, when you draw the line, it's a type So um, with schizophrenic, that's where the criteria count a bit more. So you've got, you might have some magical thinking kind of things, but then you've also got things like disorganized thoughts, um, hallucinations, things like that. Okay. Then we've got cluster B, and they're the ones who you see in the movies and who present a hospital um, because they're the loudest. So um, I suppose the squeakiest wheel always gets the most grease. So there's antisocial personality disorder and so I always paint a picture, like I said. So these are the criminals. They don't care about other people. They'll lie, they'll steal, they'll cheat, they'll get in trouble with the law, they'll do drugs. Um, and because they destroy all of their relationships and their function in society, they often don't get through school and have literacy problems. And they're mostly male. And so people in the clockwork orange would be an example of that. Then you've got borderline, and that's the most... Um, <clears throat> that's a bit extra, yeah. Um, so these people, they can't stand the idea of being alone, but also when they're with someone, they'll find ways to make the relationship break down and cause conflict. They have very low self-esteem and they don't really have a good view of themselves. They're prone to really strong emotions. They're always feeling unfulfilled. And that's often why they cycle through partners. Um, and it predisposes to a lot of morbidity and mortality because they often self-harm and that can lead to death. Their rationale for self-harming isn't necessarily suicide and more often than not, um, it isn't suicide, but they might inadvertently harm themselves to the point of no return. Um, you can consider it as a trauma disorder almost because a lot of them come from backgrounds of trauma um, whether that be emotional, physical, or even sexual abuse. So I think of perhaps a woman who grew up in a very violent household. There might have been an element of sexual abuse there. And then she grows up to become this very angry um, person who seems to date a lot of people who clearly are unsuited for her. But um, she finds that they're a way of filling um, a void, if only for a short amount of time. And it is female dominant. So. <clears throat> then we've got uh, histrionic personality disorder. So these are the people who are really, really extra and they're attention seeking, they love it. Um, they uh, might even have manipulative suicidal gestures. So by doing that they draw a lot of attention to themselves and it's also female dominant <coughs> uh if you go home and you open this presentation up and you click on king guy fashion you'll see a really good clip um maybe i'll just show one clip in the interests of time <laughs> Why are you even calling about? I'm starving. Man, I hate those things. Coach Carr makes us eat those when we want to move up weight class. What? You make you gain weight like crazy. <laughs> so that's your really attention seeking behavior. It's really dramatic. Yeah, and so you get the idea. There's also a video for um, narcissistic stuff, but we won't go through that today. 
The Kim one's really good, so you should try watching it. So narcissistic people, it's essentially what it says. They think they're really important. Um, they're really entitled. They think that everyone should like them and respect them, even if they haven't necessarily earned it. They get really angry if someone disagrees with them because their opinion is the one that counts and they need constant admiration. If they don't get it, they might even fall into a state of depression. And that's mostly males. Then we've got cluster C. So cluster A was the really odd eccentric people. Cluster B are the loud, dramatic people. Cluster C are those anxious, fearful people. Um, so there's avoidant personality disorder. And so my picture is of one of those um, fedora guys who hides behind an internet chat room. Uh, he's really afraid of being rejected and being embarrassed socially. He wants a girlfriend, but he's afraid of taking the steps in case something bad happens. And so that's avoiding personality disorder. It's dependent personality disorder, which is where um, it's female dominant. So my picture of this is, um, and some of these aren't politically correct, but they work. So my picture of this is a housewife with um, like a rich CEO husband and everything she does is for him and she doesn't really look after her own needs. So her husband's like, um, I want to go to this restaurant tonight, cook me a steak or something. And she's like, yes, sure, I'd love to do it. And then they have issues when that person isn't with them. They might feel really anxious. Um, so that's dependent personality disorder. Paint your own picture. Then there's obsessive compulsive, like I've mentioned before. They're the perfectionists. They often fail to see past the big picture. They'll spend a lot of time on one thing, but not necessarily get everything else right. They want everything done their way. Now, this is um, a parking lot diagram of personality disorders. I'll let you look at it in your own time. <coughs> so, treating them. Firstly, as with that diagnostic hierarchy, it's really important. Have you ruled, up, ruled out anything higher up? So, if someone is dependent, have you ruled out um, disorders of anxiety? Maybe there's separation anxiety disorder there. And the issue with personality disorders, so with obsessive compulsive disorder, that was ego dystonic, as in the person knows they've got it and they don't like it. Personality disorders are ego syntonic. They often don't realise that they've got it and they're okay with feeling in that way. They're okay with um, being a narcissistic douche, for example. There's not much you can do for personality disorders other than to educate them, tell them what they're doing is bad for other people and maybe offer some CBT. Um, but they're very hard to treat because they're egocentric. They don't, the patients don't really have that insight into furthering their lives. The only one, and this will come up in exams, which has a really good evidence base for treatment, is borderline personality disorder. And the buzzword here is dialectical behavioural therapy. So that can really increase... Um, their lifespan because they're not going to self-harm as much. So that combines CBT elements with skills and how to interact with other people and um, a lot of group work as well. Um, I'm not really sure about what's the best way to approach it. However, um, last year when I was on my psych rotation, I did have a psychiatrist who essentially called that person out, gave them that diagnosis, and then that kind of generated an opening for some insight there. I'm not really sure how you'd approach it. So, um, so yeah, borderline and dialectical. And medications don't really help in this case. <coughs> okay. So Isabel, a 51-year-old divorcee who calls herself an astrotherapist, believes that she can detect auras around people and thus diagnose their health status. Um, she fears that a male neighbour might be using magical powers to disrupt her love life. She has many books on occult. Um, in an interview, she has no clear-cut delusions, nor does she experience hallucinations. And her son says she's always been like this. So what do we think? It's a yeah, that's right. And why then would it not be schizophrenia? Because it's like, she's, she's schizophrenic, she's like, 
be able to find the classification <coughs> she has of the, the delusional magic. She's yeah. That's right. She doesn't satisfy the criteria. She doesn't have that disorganized thinking, actual real delusions and hallucinations. Okay, I've kind of already answered this one for you guys. A 27-year-old male computer technician wants help with his shyness. He's never had a girlfriend and would like to have a close relationship. He says he has no confidence and is afraid of rejection. So what's that? Yeah, avoidant personality disorder. The reason why it isn't something like schizoid where someone is similarly socially isolated is because this guy wants relationships and interactions with other people, whereas schizoid people don't really care about that. So I realised we're at seven. I said we'd be done in an hour, so we've got about 10 minutes to go, so we should probably get there. Um, a 55-year-old male sorter presents with acute anxiety symptoms because his boss is asking him to work more quickly. He is not prepared to do this as he is afraid of making mistakes. What do you think this is? Yeah, obsessive compulsive. That's right, personality disorder. And um, it's different from plain obsessive compulsive disorder because we don't actually have like obsessions per se, which leads to compulsions. Um, this is more someone who's a bit of a perfectionist and because he's trying to get everything right, he takes too long. Okay, Alistair, always uh, aged 45, always expects the worst from people. Salesmen see him coming and try to sell him poor quality goods at inflated prices. So-called friends borrow from him without any intention of retaining anything. His wife left him because he is always so bitter and resentful about things. Work is also terrible, but he doesn't leave because it would be worse somewhere else. Yeah, that's right. Paranoid personality disorder. This is a guy who mistrusts society. He sees an intention behind everything. He thinks every salesperson is trying to rip him off. Um, yeah, that's essentially, essentially it. And it says always, so it's long-standing. Okay, so psychotherapies. What a lot of people think of when we say psychotherapy is sitting on the couch and spilling out your guts. And that is a type of psychotherapy, but it's not all of them. So the one where they're on the couch and talking about how terrible their childhood was is called psychodynamic psychotherapy. So psychotherapies are when you treat the psyche, the mind, with talking. Um, and you can divide it up, like shown. <clears throat> so individual. Also, one thing is a lot of these psychotherapies in practice emerged with each other. So we've got clear categories here, but in behavioral therapy, for example, graded exposure therapy, a psychiatrist or psychologist might also employ cognitive techniques to help. Um, but behavioral therapies are ones that change your behavior. They don't necessarily change your thinking. So. An example of that would be greater exposure therapy for a specific phobia. It doesn't necessarily try to make you less afraid of spiders, but what it does is try to mm, change the way that you react to them. So greater exposure is a type of that. Um, often it's also classed as a cognitive behavioral therapy as well. So cognitive, like we see, it is where you're addressing cognitions because what the theory behind cognitive behavioral therapy is that your cognitions, your thoughts and your feelings affect your behavior. 
and your behavior vice versa also affects your thoughts and your feelings so therefore if you can challenge and adapt these bad behaviors or these bad cognitions then you can solve the problem that's cognitive behavioral therapy <clears throat> and there's classical which is i've talked about and it changes the ways of thinking um and then there's what's more common and the main one is mindfulness based cbt so if you paid any attention in first or second year you'll be able to answer when someone asks you what it is so it's when you get someone to recognize their thoughts acknowledge them and either you can move past them or you can deal with them as you need so that's mindfulness based cbt and we'll go a bit into that in the next slide psychodynamic like i said that's the kind of therapy where it's like tell me about your childhood oh um my mother was a really um distant woman and she never really showed me any affection when i showed her affection and then the psycho therapist will be like oh is that why you now have trust issues with people that's psychodynamic psychotherapy um supportive psychotherapy is essentially like counseling listening being empathetic whereas expressive is what i just mentioned it's where you're trying to clarify ideas and maybe even offer solutions then there's interpersonal therapy remember this one as kind of a buzzword so interpersonal therapy is often used in depression but it's where the depression relates to a role transition so someone becoming a new mother someone maybe um, being demoted at work and now they have a different role so that's interpersonal therapy <clears throat> so in terms of the mindfulness based cbts um, acceptance and commitment therapy so this is another buzzword which does pop up in the emq answer lists it's where you accept and you recognize your thoughts and then you choose to let them go so that's mindfulness is we're taught really then there's dialectical like i mentioned before and then there's just mindfulness based cbt <clears throat> then there's group therapies so couple therapy family therapy family therapy is useful um, especially in things like anorexia um, it's where you examine relationships between people and also their roles is a child playing the role of a parent for example and there's um, other types of group therapy and by self-help we mean things like alcoholics anonymous narcotics anonymous that's really just supportive and it involves the 12-step program and there's no actual therapist involved it's all participant led <coughs> so here are a few tables they are they might be on your moodle they're from a lecture given by a psychiatrist however the thing is that this guy doesn't write the exams the exams are written by i think ian presnell so whatever you see on those middle quizzes stick with that kind of framework but this is essentially right so for anxiety disorders you use graded exposure in general and you might consider other forms of cbt as well you might also consider relaxation teaching them relaxation techniques or psychodynamic therapy especially if their anxiety stems from an underlying cause or experience that you might be able to flesh out while they're lying on the couch talking about the childhood <clears throat> then we've got depressive disorders and cbt is really the key to that but also um, psychoeducation making sure that they take their medications teaching them how to recognize if they're about to relapse and how to get help that's all really important and then in treating depression with psychotherapy there's something that we call activity scheduling so in depression there's often a motivation and people become withdrawn and they don't do much activity scheduling um, is a means of trying to encourage them to do more and what you do is they keep a diary and they list things they've done through the day and how it makes them feel and often people will realize that they've done more with their day than they realize and that can make them feel better um yeah and then bipolar disorder medication compliance is really important for that because sometimes a person might feel fine 
But if they stop taking their lithium, then they might relapse again. So it's important that they recognize that. <laughs> With substance disorders, um, motivational interviewing can help. That's a form of psychotherapy. Um, Self-help as well, like Alcoholics Anonymous and CBT, psychodynamic psychotherapy, if um, personal experiences play into that. So I once met a patient with borderline personality disorder, but who also had an addiction to um, alcohol and benzos. And through psychodynamic psychotherapy, it was revealed that she took all of these drugs in an attempt to numb the pain of her existence. So that's how it can help. Personality disorders, we've already covered that. There's not really much you can do apart from being borderline. But the thing is, um, say in an OSCE, you get a STEM, uh, you get a station which is about management, um, and it's about a personality disorder. So you probably won't get a personality disorder OSCE, but if you do, it'll be borderline. But just say, for example, it was narcissistic personality disorder, then through your biopsychosocial framework, psycho the management options there would be things like psychoeducation, making them realize the impact of their condition. So you can always include those psychological first aid things in your psychological discussion for that framework. And that applies to a lot of conditions, post-traumatic stress, um, schizophrenia, it's not just antipsychotics. The psychological side of management involves um, psychotherapies. The social management could involve getting them services, getting them financial support. So always use that framework. Um, and yeah, that's essentially what I've said here. So schizophrenia, psychoeducation, emphasize how important it is to take their medications and what are the early warning signs that they might not be well. Um, you can try CBT, especially if it's treatment resistant. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe, say in CBT, one of the applications of it could be if their voices never go away, then CBT might help you to live with those voices and just accept them. In case management as well, action, making sure they have a job, a house, healthcare. <laughs> then there's various situational um, situations where targeted therapies help. So if you've lost someone, grief, Therapy could help. Um, yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, so moving on to some questions. Fraser accepts that he's been ill and feels that the medication has helped get rid of his voices and he's now better and wants to go home. He doesn't see the point in taking tablets now that is well and he promises that he won't get sick again. When you express your concern, he promises to come back and see you if he gets sick again. So what would we use here? <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Psychoeducation. We want to emphasize the importance of sticking to your medication. And if that doesn't work, then you might want to consider um, a depot or something like that. <clears throat> Isabella has presented to the emergency department for the fourth time this year, having cut her wrists after a major argument with her boyfriend. Um, after he wanted to break up. In hindsight, he feels that he should have been concerned when she repeatedly told him that he was so much nicer than the other boyfriend she had broken up with earlier in the year. D. D. And why is that? That's right. Dialectical behavior therapy, because she's borderline. You can see that there's that emotional instability, um, the self-harm, and there's also what we call uh, splitting, and that's classic of borderline. That's where people with borderline view something as all good, up uh, view people as either all good or all bad. So um, it often happens if you get a borderline patient um, on the ward, they'll split your team. The consultant will be the all bad person and then the lovely resident will be the all good person. And they can switch these roles at any time. And what they do, this is an attempt to protect themselves because they assign very clear roles to people, but it doesn't really work. <clears throat> so that's what I meant, splitting. Um, this boyfriend is so much nicer than all of the others. He's all good, 
that he suddenly become all bad. Okay, so Laura, age 17, is reviewed after an impulsive overdose of her mother's blood pressure medication in the context of an argument with her boyfriend. She remains angry at him and refuses to talk with her mother. There are no symptoms of major depression. <coughs> Um, later on, it might have a role. So this is a question of Moodle, and I think a lot of people get it wrong. The answer is crisis intervention. And crisis intervention is where you use psychotherapy in the very short term to try to um, cool down a situation to prevent further harm. So here it's clearly a crisis. She's overdosed. And she's very emotional and erratic at this point, and you just want to try to calm her down. So that's why it's important to do the Moodle questions, because if this came up, you would know the answer, which isn't necessarily what you're expecting. Down the line, it could be revealed that she's borderline, especially if this is repeated pattern. But for now, crisis intervention is the most important thing to do. OK, so we're essentially finished. Um, just remember the diagnostic hierarchy. Um, in your OSCEs especially, if it's management or diagnosis, you always say, I first want to rule out organic conditions. Um, can something be better explained by another psychiatric condition? So could your um, schizophrenia be better explained by a delusional disorder? They're similar, but there are nuances between each. So you always consider those. Feel free to ask me um, any questions and remember to look after yourself. Sasu is great. Okay. Um, hope you'll have your own GP to talk to if you need. Sasu, if you're having a lot of trouble, you can go to them. If you're having a little trouble, you can still go to them. If you feel like you're really bad at doing mental state exams, you can just email them and set up a time and they'll go through how to do a mental state exam with you. So it's a very useful service. These are my references. And thank you. <laughs> cool. Um, would you, if you're taking like a history, would you specifically like go rule out organic causes first, or would you like, like how would you approach that? Would you, um, would you do like different system reviews?